thanks everyone for joining the eight-week series. It has been a fantastic series so far. Uh, the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive, so we do feel like uh, we're going to take a couple-week break, but we'll put together another lineup of speakers and do this later in the year as well. We are, are really pleased today to give you a sneak peek at some research that we have been doing. So it's nice to have seen uh, speakers one through seven talk about uh, the data foundation, talk about some issues in the space, but really excited to have Stephanie uh, end this series with some hard numbers and research that, that will be coming out later. Uh, so with that, Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, please remember everybody that you can submit questions to me directly in the question box, and, uh, and I will read those at the end during the Q&A session. Hi, thank you, Matt, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's actually hard to believe that it's eight weeks since we kicked this off. Uh, I don't know if you feel like me, but it feels like the weeks are just blending into, into one. Uh, meanwhile, so much has happened in our lives and our businesses and things have moved incredibly fast. Um, so today I want to take the time to go back for eight weeks ago. And, and I remember March 25th when we did this first webinar, I was still attempting to have a March break uh, out West and uh, logged in and thinking in eight weeks where we're gonna be, you know, with, with everything happening. And also I was really eager to hear the perspective of our thought leaders. Uh, we've had some pretty phenomenal people in the industry, influencers who took the time and were very excited about the opportunity to share their perspective on what, what, what does it mean to have poor supplier data um, and uh, the importance of having a really solid data foundation and data strategy to the future of procurement. And we've been talking about this for years, but I would say that in the last eight weeks, more than ever, supply chain or, or supplier data has really come at the forefront, and I think we can all agree that this is the time for procurement and supply chain to, uh, you know, to to it's our moment. It's the time to shine, and it, it we can actually uh, be a huge uh, factor in and the success of our organizations getting through this crisis on a strong uh, position. So just going back in time, my first presentation. Uh, that I did, I was talking about observations from the industry. And what I pointed out is that we've been talking about this for a long time. There's a lot of data, it's not just my opinion, there's a lot of data in the industry that support the importance of having a good data quality. Um, I pointed a few, um, it's actually one specific study that I really like that was uh, done with Rob Hansfield from NC State and Joe Yakura. And that study had been done over a three year period and they're also sponsored by some of the largest tech companies. The 2018 was sponsored by IBM, and the 2019 was sponsored by iValua. And you know, there's a lot of great data point here. I think we can all kind of agree to this. 75% of businesses that say that poor, poor data quality has made it very challenging to achieve their digital transformation plan. 89% of the businesses said that meeting their digital transformation plan will require a structured data migration. Uh, that they're lacking the talent to have uh, an effective digital transformation, and also um, that they, you know, that they believe that high quality data is the fuel to their digital transformation. On the second study, what I pointed out is that when we ask a thousand supply chain executives what was getting in the way of their digital transformation, it seemed that tools and processes were quite low in inhibiting this effective transformation. And so I think we've all you know, thought a lot about processes and, and our function has invested millions of dollars in technology, but it doesn't seem, or in software I should say, and it doesn't seem to be the barrier to digital transformation. What seems to be the biggest barrier is poor data quality and standardization and governance, as well as the ability to extract the information that you need to drive better and more effective decisions. And Chris Sasha uh, came in on week two and it was really hard to pick. <laughs> I was over the last couple of days going back to the presentation. There's a lot of really good stuff. So if you haven't had a chance yet to listen to the eight week series, please download them. They're on our YouTube channel. So they're available with the slides. Um, but one of the things that uh, Chris, and Chris and I have been talking for a few years about this, is what differentiates our technologies really on the intelligence. We're not competing with software company. What we're doing is powering software company with, with intelligence and intelligence is really the future um, and so when he's talked about some of the different 
studies that they've done at the Hackett Group, he talked about the problem experienced due to poor master data, highlighting uh, internal debates over which data is accurate and trusted. So I think there's a very low trust in the quality of the data today, and we'll see more of that. Uh, the, inef the inefficiency of planning and reporting or analysis, and so we're pretty blinded by the fact that we can't do proper strategy because we lack data. And then, you know, other things like poor supplier relationship, poor customer services, and uh, inefficiency of purchasing and sourcing as a function. And then the benefits derived from quality data, the improvement in the quality, the accuracy of our reporting, uh, be able to make better decisions, have single view of your suppliers. Those are all things that we've been hearing about, but it's nice to see it supported by uh, the Hackett Group. Now, uh, Eloise, good friend as well. I've, I love to see her speak, and, and I do think that she's been speaking actually about this. I've been seeing this slide for a couple of years, so this is not new news. And we've, we've made a small dent into advancing into this future state, but we're still very much, the majority of organizations are very much on the left side where you know, they have a technology stack. Each of their technology stack has data that feeds that technology, it needs to be manually enriched, uh, manually cleansed, manually enriched, manually uh, populated, manually maintained, um, either through services or through suppliers or internal resources. And, and, and the gap is that there's no real easy way to be able to unify all these data points to be able to have a unified view of who you do business with today. And so I saw this as the biggest barrier and that's what prompted me to, to start Scalebook. But this is very much still the reality for most organizations having to make decisions as to where is it gonna be the data gonna live into having you know use of IT resources to trying to figure out ways to integrate the data to different software. And then you're kind of stuck with your investment because there's a lot of friction with uh, replacing software when you've made these really important decisions and taken a lot of IT uh, resources or external resources. And moving into uh, the, the, the future, the near future state, this is where really Tailbook is today, can elevate a company from today to horizon one, is having a data foundation in the cloud that can power your technology so that it's powered from a universal supplier record. And so whoever's consuming data from those systems is, are able to access the same record that's validated, updated, and it feeds back into that data lake. And so this is where we play today, and we're very much, you know, investing uh, on the pure state where, you know, we see procurement to become a, a suite of digital integrated solutions connected to the AI hub. Uh, so that you're really not bound by technology. Technology is a means to, to be able to do workflow, uh, to be able to, you know, um, uh, work on, on some processes that are still very important to try and automate some of those or go deeper into different areas of procurement. But we're, we're looking at a future where it's fully integrated, best in class. And, and, and I purposely didn't use the logo slide because it doesn't really matter which logo does what right now is that what we're going to see is a very crowded space of digital solutions. It's already a $20 billion software market that's, that's looking that it's going to expand uh, exponentially over the next uh, few years. And so this is very much where we are heading um, and we are helping companies elevate from today to horizon one and with us getting into a journey from horizon one to horizon two. And Tim Herod, another friend, uh, I do assist with both Eloise and Tim Herod on the ISM Thought Leadership Council. So we've had some really good healthy debates and we're planning to have one live in a couple of weeks based on the webinar series. Um, and it was really hard to pick Tim Herod's uh, slide because we had a lot of really, really good stuff. Uh, but I want to be sort of more consistent to the story that we're telling today around supplier data and how it's an essential foundation for procurement to really bring value. And so he's pointed out things like, you know, that everything that we do in procurement and supply chain tie back to a supplier. The more suppliers or potential supplier data that we have, the more, the more visibility we get, the more opportunities that we're able to gain. And then we reduce the lost opportunities, which is much harder to quantify, but then can create an enormous amount of value. Uh, that the vendor master is not the supplier universe. It's, you need to know what you don't know. And you need to, to know what you don't know as fast as possible so that you can capitalize on those opportunities. And then enriching your, your master data inside and outside, having information from the outside in is super important. Data changes so fast. It's impossible actually for an organization to be able to keep track of all the different 
you know, changes in words in real time, and we'll see uh, some of that in the study as well. Uh, faster, better, cheaper to buy versus build critical strategic AI, AI ML capabilities. Jeff alluded to this in his webinar last week. A question was, you know, how do we build an ML team in-house? And Jeff said, don't. <laughs> basically don't. Uh, because, you know, the type of talent and the way that you manage them, it's much more research-based, uh, uh, makes it incredibly difficult to lead uh, an ML team. And, and in order to have effective models, you need data. And if you're only bound to the data from your organization, you're going to be, you know, really, really, really narrow in what you're able to do. And effectively, they're going to be mostly cleaning data and trying to keep up with data and, and instead of doing a proper modeling. So it'll be very difficult to attract them. Uh, attract the talent that you'd want. Um, and how many suppliers data point channel, you know, interactions internally, externally do you need? How do you grab all of this? It's actually not humanly possible. You know, we look at 400 different, uh, 400 million different, uh, you know, most traffic sites and thousands of different sources to, to aggregate data from. You can't actually humanly do this. And so the machines are there to really help uh, so that you can have visibility and then get the information that you need at the time that you need it so that you can drive better and faster decisions. Um, and then, you know, have others to see value the way that you do. It's really important. And, and Tim alluded to this, to take a more of a stakeholder experience approach. What is their experience through the journey? And then map that from there so that you can build a fully enabling, frictionless, agile, value add uh, procurement function in the digital world. And then Walt talked about, um, you know, what I liked what he said, which is really practical, is that there's some teams that are not there to change, to do the full transformation. And so, you know, if you don't have maybe the priority or the leadership, um, you know, support, or maybe you don't have the right talent right now, um, you can pick some, some really high value uh, use cases that you can win. And so, you know, how Walt uses big data is to increase competitiveness. And that's how he's been able to drive an enormous amount of savings. Like, why go to three bids and a buy if you can access instantly a thousand companies that sell the same unit? Just go off to bid with a thousand companies and you're going to get savings and, you know, incredible savings. And some of the, the data that he shared is quite impressive. So, talking about, he called it a, 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 a funnelless bidding approach so how can you get as many suppliers as possible to drive that hyper uh, competitiveness and saving and then matt spoke about the benefits of uh how you know we talked more specifically ever about our technology so if you're interested in hearing that uh please go back to here is a webinar but what you talked about is the the, uh, the upside so drastically enhancing your source to pay usability You've invested in technology. We hear more and more that there is overrun budget, a ton of frictions. There's so many lawsuits on, you know, implementations gone bad of software companies. And, and software companies have told a really good digitization story and a, and, and a good digital transformation story, but they don't fix the data. And so I think a lot of procurement team felt a little bit fooled by the fact that they thought that buying a, a cloud-based source to pay or P2P was going to fix their data problem. And then realizing that it's not, it's actually creating a lot of frictions. And we're hearing things, you know, we've heard from a city that they were $54 million over budget because of the poor data quality. Um, other is, is how fast can you actually do the implementation? If you're able to remove the variable of your uh, system integrator to be able to, I mean, they're, they're, they're not data people either, right? So they're there to, to uh, implement. But if you're able to remove that variable to instantly uh, cleanse your data, unify your record, enhance your data, populate your software, and cover 100% of your suppliers without relying your suppliers to come into a portal, I mean, we're talking about, you know, activating your investment much faster and also maximizing the investment that you have in your S2P or P2P, which we know it's millions of dollars. And supply chain optimization, so how do we rationalize? Rationalization has gotten too much attention for far too long. So how do we look at the data to be able to map out your category strategy? So examples of that is to see clusters of suppliers that do exactly the same thing. So we see once we start, you know, enriching the vendor master, we can see that there's 400 recruiting firms or there's 4,000 market research companies. And out of that, you know, 40% look like they do exactly the same thing and they're similar size and maybe even similar geography. 
So that would allow you to start building a consolidation strategy for those categories. And you look at other categories that are very stagnant, but when you have visibility beyond your vendor master, you're able to start seeing that there's opportunities outside of, of your organization to be able to, to tap into uh, suppliers that may be more competitive or more innovative. And then that, you can use that to, to challenge the status quo and complacency that usually fits in, in using the same suppliers over and over again. Um, and then eliminated the, the data enrichment project. We know that these are one-time enrichments. As soon as you put the data back into the organization, the data becomes stale. And so how do you have a mechanism to make the data better over time and then you know, enable an agile supply chain? And we've seen this in the past eight weeks, the, um, you know, how fast organizations had, had to shift gears. And we've seen a lot of problems because you know, agility is a big word. It should be your North Star, actually. Uh, but it's not so easy to do, especially if you don't have visibility into your supply base. And then we, we uh, wrapped up last week with Jeff. Uh, I actually was tempted to put Jeff's face there because I do, I am quite visible. You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time advocating for uh, the importance of data over the past few years. And so a lot of people see Stephanie and I hear, you know, when th good news happen, it's usually congratulations, Stephanie and team. Um, and Jeff, you know, doesn't, command to be more visible, leave the brain behind our, our, our technology. And so Jeff was the gift when I met him. I had vision, I, had, I knew the problem that we, I wanted to solve, but Jeff came from working at Google. You know, he had worked at Ariba for about 10 years when they're building the um, catalog and supplier network. And prior to that was at IBM. And also I did a second master's in computer sciences uh, in machine learning. And so, uh, it was, you know, the fact that he was in Toronto, he was available at the time I needed him, and he had all these components. It was sort of a bit of magic dust. So when Jeff joined us three and a half years ago, he rebuilt Tailbook using uh, the foundation of already laid by Google and be able to native bring uh, machine learning, build a data scientist team, and start seeding our data right away. And all the things that we're able to do today, which are extraordinary, is because of his leadership and his experience and the team that he's built. And what Jeff reinforced, uh, I think he gave a really good introduction of, of the application of AI without talking specifically about Tailbook, uh, but what he re reinforces that AI is not there to replace us. AI is there as a tool to enable us to see things so that we can do more. So having more impact on spend, having more um, you know, impact on the organization to drive value. And, and we've seen this happening in so many different functions, but somehow procurement has not been able yet to tap into the level of data and analytics required to do our job more effectively. So what we've done, we've partnered with Wakefield, um, and this study is actually was done in March. So we're talking about fairly relevant, uh, you know, current uh, research. Um, so the, the, the data should be quite uh, appropriate for even in times like the crisis that we're facing today. Um, and just so you know, you're getting a sneak peek. This will be published on the 19th. So there's a press release and the data will be picked up. And what's been most shocking by our PR team as they're presenting this to the media is that outside of procurement, they are shocked to see that this data, they're shocked to see that supplier data is such a big problem and how mainstream is across all organizations. In a time like what we're facing, where we need access to information really fast, um, it's, I think it's even more prevalent. So again, it comes back to supply chain and data having a lot of uh, visibility right now um, in, in the media. Um, and so we interviewed through this, uh, Wakefield interviewed 250 procurement and sourcing executives. So we're talking about executive level. Uh, and the goal is to determine how supplier data is impacting the organization. Um, and what we found is, you know, we knew this, but it was actually really, really enlightening to see that uh, there are truly severe business consequences that are stemming from poor supplier data. And we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. So what we found, uh, supplier data is more than ever a business critical component of operations for the organization worldwide. And we, we've always, you know, we've all not always known this. I think we all know that data is bad and data is important, but it's sort of how do we quantify this in a way that we can build a business case for investing in data? Um, and that's what we've been trying to do through this whole series is to give you the tool, one, recognizing how to talk about data and what are the, the upside of having uh, 
access to good data. And there's, again, there's no excuse. We have the technology today to be able to, to do this and, and be able to go back to your leadership team to build a business case um, for investing in data because it's not as tangible as buying software, but it's so foundational to your, your digital transformation and the future of your technology stack. And what we've seen is enterprises are experiencing severe problem resulting from misinformation and outdated supplier records. And the survey revealed a staggering number of critical issues that enterprises are dealing with due to poor supplier data. In fact, 93% of procurement and supply chain leaders have experienced adverse effects of misinformation about their suppliers on a regular basis. So this is not at some point, this is on a regular basis that the, I mean, more than the majority, I mean, the majority, almost everyone uh, claim. And if they haven't, I would be really interested to know that 7%, maybe they just bought a, a cloud-based SAP or P2P, so they think that it's, the, the data is going to be fixed. Um, but, you know, 95% is not insignificant. More specifically, uh, companies spend an average of 21 days to validate and onboard their suppliers. And so this is not the sourcing piece. This is not finding and qualifying suppliers. We have data on that, that it requires 41 hours of effort time over five to six weeks on average. Uh, and this was a study we, we did previously with the Hackett Group. This is once you have the supplier and you need to do diligence and onboard them into your system. I think 21 days is absolutely unacceptable, especially to the business that are just trying to get their job done. And so if we're so bogged down into process and we have to collect different records and we have to go and do diligence on suppliers before they even are on board to our system, I mean, we're failing our business stakeholders like, immensely. So how can we shrink that down to, you know, ideally no time? How do we have all the information at hand to be able to onboard suppliers so that ultimately their stakeholders just can get the job done with the best suppliers, with the best value, with mitigating risk and, and all those important factors that we're considering? 81% are not completely confident in their supplier data. I think that's actually low. <laughs> At most conferences, uh, when I speak, I ask, usually, and we're talking about CPO level of the largest companies in the world, I ask, raise your hand if you have some confidence in the quality and the completeness of your supplier data today. And everyone laughs. Everyone looks around. No one raised their hand. And then when I ask them, you know, raise your hand if you believe that good quality and complete uh, supplier data is absolutely critical to your digital transformation, you get 100% of people raising their hands. And to me, it speaks volume. I mean, it, it lends itself incredibly well to, to the fact that we do have this massive supplier data gap, and we need to fix this. Um, and 60% of executives reporting outdated supplier information said it took them four days to update this data. And we're talking about executive level spending four days to update records on suppliers they do business with. Again, absolutely, absolutely unacceptable and, and quite shocking. So procurement executive experience the following. So these are questions that <clears throat> they needed to say if they experienced, um, you know, these different situations based on information, outdated information or confusing information about their suppliers. And so 62% claim that they've been wasting time uh, probably collecting records or doing duplication of effort or doing really tactical work. 47% have said that they had projects being delayed because of poor data quality. And so again, if you're trying to create a value add function to your stakeholders and you're responsible for delaying projects, it, you're going to be seen as a huge roadblock and friction to the business. So how do you, you know, how do you address that? 24% said that poor data quality as, or misinformation has terminated supplier relationships. 24% has terminated supplier relationship. Um, that's, pretty, that's pretty shocking. This is not per, poor performance on the suppliers or um, this is around not being, being misinformed or having confused information. So the cost of that alone, especially to the business, um, is, will be staggering. 51% of poor data resulted in missed deadlines. So again, we're talking about uh, delays in project and, and deadlines. 42% of either internal, external customers have been unhappy. Uh, and we're talking about a 40% financial loss due to poor data quality. So if this is not a use case that you can present to your leadership, I don't know what it would be, because this, this information is, is quite uh, shocking and revealing. So more results, most alarming is the finding that more than half, so almost 60% who use a supplier portal do not trust their suppliers to keep the information updated. 
And I think this is one of the, the biggest I mean, false assumptions that procurement teams have made is to have a supplier portal and a supplier portal will, will grab information because we're going to put on the suppliers and the suppliers want to do business with us. And so they're going to keep the information up to date. And we hear this all the time, especially if an organization has just invested in the SDP or, or P2P. And while we have a, a, a portal, suppliers want to do business with us because we have a big name, they will be uh, updating their information. And, and we smile because we do know that the, the data on the, the number of suppliers updating portal is really low. There's very little ROI for suppliers to do it. They have to do it across all their customers and all their customers as multiple instances of a portal across multiple systems, of course. And so, um, you know, the portal fatigue, was, which is a term I think AP Kearney had come up with, is real. Um, suppliers do not, you know, as soon as they see another invitation to often the same technology, but a different portal for a different customer, uh, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, some, some, some huge waste of time. So, um, in fact, this data misinformation has led to executives citing financial loss two-thirds, 67% have seen losses within the last six months. So we're talking about financial loss, right? Financial loss of the organization. Uh, we're, you know, we're, there's so much time spent right now um, trying to not lose <laughs> financially or operationally, especially in times of crisis like this, um, that we need to really pay attention to this, that 67% uh, I've, I've got financial loss, and I apologize. I am working from home, as, as I'm sure you guys are, so there's a little distraction in the background. Uh, companies are still using time-consuming methods to research and validate their suppliers, so relying on antiquated methods. You know, this is the same thing that we've been using. Search engine, probably not 40 years old, but still uh, at least the last decade that we've been using uh, Google to find information, and, and we spend a lot of time, and there's not a lot of learning brought back to the organization. It's not easy to find data. It's highly biased if it's at paid ads. It's, it's cluttered with a lot of other, you know, information that are not relevant to finding what someone needs. So there's still a lot of sorting through online searches and industry conferences, which we'll see a lot less of. So we'll need to be able to find ways to replace this. And then industry publications, which, you know, gives you some perspective, but it doesn't give you all the perspective. It doesn't also include the relevance of the information to you, to your function, to your organization, to your industry. So in conclusion, what we've learned um, is trusted supply information is the most critical asset a procurement organization can possess. Every information that, that you have ties into supplier. And if you don't have that supplier information at hand, unified in a way that's actionable, you're going to lose. You're actually going to be quite paralyzed in making some decisions. And the, and the more you can take that data and put in the hands of people making decisions every day, the better you're going to be seen as a value-add partner and as an enabler. I think the CPO of Cisco said it at Procurement Leaders recently, because we're going to win in building a true digital procurement functions when employees will not know procurement actually exists. Uh, and I know this is potentially controversial, but if you think about it, if you can lay the foundation for fully enabling a strategic procurement function, uh, you, can, you, you, can, you, can, you can impact so much more spend. You can enable so much opportunities to happen. And this can't happen just with technology alone. It has to happen with data first. Uh, the information is the fuel that powers all procurement technologies. And Chris Sashak often gives this, this, um, uh, this image of Iron Man having, you know, the, the, the man being... The, the procurement person and having this technology as its armor to make it more powerful. And I'd say that data is the arc reactor that fuels the technology. I think without the arc reactor, the technology means nothing. And so think about that when you're thinking about data. And then, you know, we're influencing billions of dollars. That's why we're also very passionate. We care so much about our function. Procurement, your suppliers are as important as your customers. They're as important as your employees. Meanwhile, you know, we, we, have not, we have not invested in having the proper foundation to truly understand our supplier network or supplier base and the opportunities. And, and that impacts, you know, operational efficiencies to mitigate. And we're talking about, you know, when we're trying to quantify the value of good supplier data, I don't think anyone can actually do it because it's so immense. And so we're trying in different ways with different use cases. But if you took at all the data point that points out to having a good data foundation that fuels your entire procurement stack that buyers have access to to drive better decisions, I think the potential is absolutely endless. 
And so hopefully that was insightful. Um, please look out for the press release on the, the data next week. Uh, please share with your network. And if you have any questions, if you feel that you want to have more data point or have a discussion with your team to build your use case around investing in your data foundation, you know, we're, we're all years. We'd love to hear from you. Great. Thanks, Steph. Um, and thanks for a great eight-week series. I think we all enjoyed it very much. Uh, you do have a couple of questions here that I want to pass over your way. And so the first one is more of an open-ended question for you, and it asks you to talk more about how different procurement leaders have solved the data lake setup mentioned by Dr. Epstein. I mean, it'd be a good question for her um, because I don't think it's been done. Uh, I mean, we we are you know we're enabling that with our clients, and we're still in, in that horizon one, right? We we have the, we have the data, we have the mechanism. We're starting to generate so much more value to our customers on day one, uh, and then we're able to start looking at how do we how do we continuously demonstrate the completeness of the data and the improvement of the data over time. Um, you know, we I've seen our organizations who are working with the large uh, data company to build data lakes for, for for all the data points. It's not just procurement focus. And what we're hearing is that procurement is not the priority. And so if you're going to prioritize building a data lake and extracting data or models to be able to start having more predictability um, from, from you know, all the data points in your organization and you're not the priority, you're going to wait a really, really long time. So uh, finding ways to be able to buy basically data off the shelf, like we're, we're able to provide, gives you a much faster jump start to be able to start uh, enabling uh, data to happen. I think companies have tried for a very, very long time by building master data and their own solution. But again, if it's just your information, you're still really limited to what you know. And there's a lot that you don't know. Um, and there's a lot of data that changes on a minute by minute basis that you need, you should be aware of. And so, you know, combining the external world to what's happening in your organization, specific to your our function and procurement, I say I, I think we're the only player doing this, um, and I I would love a debate if if that's not the case. But we um, and I'm sure Louise may be able to answer that. Um, but it's definitely something that larger, more progressive organizations are trying to solve for. Yeah, and I'll I'll just maybe add just a, a tiny bit to that too. Um, is that the Horizon One on her her slide is what Tealbook does. Uh, it's Horizon 2 is the one that I don't think people have done yet. And so in, um, just to provide an additional clarity there. Um, the second question is is a longer one as well. So dealing with the S2P landscape, how do you cope with, with ERPs, uh, especially complex ones with divergent data models or accounts payable data and process potentially divergent from one country BU entity to another? I'm sure you'll have an answer to that too. Um, you know, we do customers with, with very complex ERP systems and that's actually perfect because uh, if you're thinking about your ERPs and how you're gonna map data to each other is, is would be like a monumental effort. And so some companies have just given up and that. And so how can you take those vendor master, uh, those, those data points and unify it back in a way that um, by using machine learning, you're able to take different components of data to unify back to one record and then distribute it back to your different system. And so I think it's actually uh, great if you do have a, a very disparate uh, or decentralized business with different systems, it's a great use case to unifying your data in the cloud. And that way uh, you have uh, a one source of truth for, for all of them. Um, otherwise, you're, you're, you know, you're gonna be looking at eternally mapping those systems. And Matt, if you wanna add to this, I'm sure you have an opinion. Yeah, so I, I do think that this is one of the largest problems in the space today uh, when, when thinking about a structure like what Eloise has proposed. And I, I'll answer this in a more conceptual way because we can get really granular based on the different ERPs that are out there. Um, but in general, what's really hard is taking one system that has a very structured format and then mapping it into a different system that has a completely different structured format. The the data just will, it, it can't be massaged to fit. And an analogy I use all the time is that you can't take a square peg and pound it into a round hole However, 
if you have more data at your disposal that is sat in more of an unstructured format, you can cut whatever uh, type of data structure you want out of that larger data set. And so if you imagine now a, a, a table, I can cut as many round holes or as, uh, uh, as many square holes as I would like uh, because I have more data at my disposal. And that's really the promise that we have is that we're consuming so many more data elements that then when we understand the data structure of your ERP, we can cut out the type of data that you need and then uh, massage it into those different ERPs. Uh, but happy to talk more on that with you uh, if you want to reach out to us because this is a conversation that we have all the time. Uh, staff, you're getting a whole lot of uh, compliments. The first uh, question, though, just to address it really quick, is um, asking if you can show page 14 again. I, I think there's some notes that are being taken, so if we can flip back to that one really quick. And so we'll just give a second here. Um, and then asking more on the financial loss here, can you dive deeper into the findings and where the financial co financial loss actually happens? All right. I'm not sure if we went through the specifics uh, on the studies to, to dive deeper here, do you know? Um, so the financial loss does happen in a, in a couple of areas according to the study, um, and it's pretty broad range, and you'll get the full details next week. Um, but they're everything from time loss savings, some of the terminated relationships. You think about all the time that it takes to actually uh, find new vendors, to onboard them, things like that. There's also missed opportunity costs. There's a, a number of examples, and we run into this every day where you think that there's only one or two providers in a space that actually offer a good or service, and then uh, you actually find that there are many more, and then you can start the competitive process. Because if you have the competitive process, you can drive the type of savings that Walt uh, showed in his uh, series. But if you don't have the competitive process, you're really at the, the whim of the supplier and their pricing. And so, um, that's kind of the high level answer today, but um, we will send you the full uh, study next week and then you can see the granular breakdown with the percentages next to it. So I'm just reading some of the questions that I think it's more compliments. So thank you. I, I'm glad to hear the feedback. I think we've got, as Matt mentioned, overwhelmingly positive feedback from this series. We're planning to come back. A few thought leaders from the series will have a live conversations around their learning and what they've heard um, through the series and their opinions on how it applies to today's environment. Uh, so that should be fun. So we'll, we'll definitely uh, promote that so that you can log in. Whoever's been registering to the webinar will also receive an email to join us. And as Matt alluded, we've had requests from different thought leaders that they want to be involved. So a great sign of building more community and thought leadership around the importance of data and so we're very much planning on doing another series. And so if you like this, please share. Uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn, as you probably know. So I put your, your comments there. Obviously, we what we want to do is be able to impact uh, more teams, uh, you know, give them the tools to be able to build their use case uh, for investing in, uh, in a digital, a data-led transformation. So I don't think there's any more questions, Matt. So we should we wrap it up and let everyone get back to, to work? Yes, absolutely. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this eight weeks has been very fun. Uh, we noticed that there were probably 40% of the people on the line that continue to show up uh, week after week and then the rest was more of a revolving. So those of you that stuck with us through the whole series, uh, we want to thank you. Um, we would appreciate if you continue to spread the word. If you feel free to post any of the webinars to your LinkedIn and other uh, areas. We do believe that supplier data is the number one issue facing procurement today. Um, and if any more awareness that we can draw to that problem is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. Take care.